Hello everyone, I'm Justin. It's nice to meet you. Uh, tonight I present to you the journey to the Forbidden City of Lhasa. <clears throat> it's October 1923 on the outskirts of Tibet. Alexandra David Neal is finally about to execute her plan into the Forbidden City of Lhasa. It's the British government and specifically the governor Sir Charles Bell that has forbidden her from entering Tibet. She leaves on the eastern bank of the Mekong River from a Christian mission. Her cover story is that she's in search of rare plants, a ruse that has been inspired by a meeting with American botanist, Dr. Joseph Rock. Far out in the hills, she dispatches her servants, leaving her only with her trusted traveling companion, Yongdin. Their pack contains the bare minimum, a cauldron, two bowls, two spoons, one knife, chopstick, chopsticks, sampa, tea, leather for resoling the boots, extra thongs, and a small tent. Their plan is to come and present themselves as pilgrims, losing their Chinese garments and then taking the look of a Tibetan Lama and his aging mother. Alexandra black blackens her hair with Chinese ink while lengthening it with some yak's tail. She further darkens her face with, hands, uh, with her hands and wiping the soot from the bottom of a cauldron. Traveling at night and sleeping during the day, they vowed only to speak Tibetan and concoct a believable backstory as natives of Amdo, a distant district that they actually knew well. Their first summit is the Dokhar Pass at 16,500 feet. When sleeping, they cover their tiny tent over, which gets them covered with a light dusting of snow and resembling a larger patch of snow in the forest. They are noticed by two men who are arguing about whether the patch is someone sleeping or just some snow. Yangdun can't, can't resist responding in a deep tone, it's the snow. <laughs> After which he has to then get up and greet them, but keeping Alexandra hidden. Yongdin, as the traveling lama, performs rites and rituals in the towns they come across. Alexandra helps him often, and whenever they need to leave, they use a special code word reminding them it's time to go. November 1923, they travel through the Salween River Valley. One of their encounters involved a small boy who insisted that his grandfather was waiting for their arrival. Yongdin and Alexandra try to refuse, desiring to press on, but are eventually lured to meet the sick grandfather. The grandfather does not appear to be on the brink of death, but nevertheless insists that he's been kept alive to greet Yongdin. Yongdin performs the bardo ritual. Our two explorers leave early in the morning, but they don't get far when one of the family members meets them and lets them know that their grandfather died quietly in peace that morning. December 1923, they make their way through the Po Yul, which is rumored to be cannibal territory. On their way to Shawa, this path leads them to the high mountain pass buried deep under snow. Alexander presses on, but Yongdin is starting to show fatigue. They make camp and try to make a small fire. Unfortunately, they find the flint to be too damp. Their fire isn't starting, and fearful, Yongdin goes in search of more fuel while Alexandra focuses on her training of Tumo. She focuses and puts the flint under her robe, and by the time Yongdin has returned, she has started the fire and returned hope. The following day brings disaster as Yongdin slips on some ice and falls down into a crevice. His leg is broken, but it's, it's not broken, but it's badly sprained. They make a makeshift crutch, and they press on until they come across a shepherd's summer home. That night, for survival, they use the leather from their boots to flavor their soup. The date is December 25th, 1923. With Yongdin's ankle sprain, their progress is very, very slow moving forward. As they continue their pilgrimage, they twice encounter bandits. The first group tried to take their tent and spoons, god damn it, but were warded off when Alexandra fires a warning shot with a pistol. The second bandit encounter is with a group of seven armed men. As they take Yongdin's gold pieces, Alexandra immediately flings into a tirade of warnings that those coins were earned by funeral rites and to take them would to bring evil spirits onto the thieves. Not having any of that, the thieves drop the coins and then plead for their forgiveness. <laughs> February 1924, after four months of traveling, our adventurers finally arrive in Lhasa, succeeding in accessing the Forbidden City. They spent two months in Lhasa and observed the Tibetan New Year celebration. Alexandra didn't find Lhasa particularly beautiful, feeling its architecture expressed more opulence and power than grace. Yongdin and Alexandra arrived back in France May 10th, 1925. Their exploits were well known and the public clamored to hear more of their story. It was that of great adventure, daring escapes, and an unbelievable city in the mountains. She wrote My Journey to Lhasa, which was eagerly consumed. But then the question came of, what's next? When is your next adventure? The thing is though, that her life was about an interior exploration, and this reflected her commitment to Buddhism. She saw Buddhism as a way to life and best described that journey as a path which the requirements were a willingness to face life squarely and to seek truth with diligence, good humor, and above all, an open, an open mind. Back then, nobody was interested in an interior exploration. Even this presentation here tonight was made under the theme of forbidden through her journey to a forbidden city. But what I would like to present now is the real forbidden topic, which is that of her interior exploration. 
So, my real talk. <laughs> Alexandra David Neal on the threshold of Nirvana. You see, yes, her accomplishments are that she did journey to Lhasa, and they were incredible, mind-boggling even. It's her life, though, that truly captivated me and speaks of her interior exploration. She is the person who stood apart from nearly every convention of a woman from her time. Honestly, I'm just gonna take break for a moment to say, uh, it, absolutely incredible. Like, uh, I'm gonna go through these slides and you're gonna see some of these things, but if you have a moment, you need to read up more on her because this is an incredible woman who had to do incredible things just to even get to the city. So, <sighs> Alexandra David Neal, born on October 24th, 1868 in a small town close to Paris, uh, to Louis David uh, and uh, Alexandrine. Her father, a Protestant, was a teacher turned journalist who had been expelled to Belgium during the coup d'etat of Napoleon III where he met Alexandrine, a Catholic. The two of them returned to France where they had Alexandra, and when Alexandra was born, her mother rejected her immediately, having wanting a son instead. <laughs> and note at this time, the life expectancy of someone born at this point is 40 years old. Remember that, 40. <laughs> Alexandra was an outlier. She was a capable reader by four years old, reading authors like Jules Verne. Uh, by her sixth year, she was fa her fascination in comparative religion had been established. In her mid-teens, she traveled alone to other countries, often without her parents knowing, specifically traveling to Holland and England with only a raincoat and a wedding ring to appear older. On the train ride home from one of these expeditions, she expressed interest to her mother, who went out to have to rescue her, about wanting to be a doctor, to which her mother said, absolutely out of the question. At 18, she was one day missing from breakfast. The family found out a week later, or sorry, weeks later, that she had cycled across France and went exploring Spain. <laughs> we don't know the exact distance that she went, but needless to say, I Google mapped it, and it's about Portland, Oregon to San Diego, California. Again, on a bicycle. Needless to say, this was also not the normal behavior of girls in 1886. In 1888, while living in Paris, she discovered the Musée Guimet. It's here that she was introduced to Buddhist arts and artifacts. It's also here in Paris where she starts to learn Sanskrit and when she begins identifying as a Buddhist. The note for here, keep in mind, is that at this time, the way you studied cultures and religions was very structured. The West looked at the facts about the subject, things like the age of documents, the place of birth, and the impact of historical events. To observe was permitted, but not to participate. This is sometimes referred to as going native. At 21, she claimed a legacy from her godmother and used it to travel to India, again, alone. This is the uniform of women in the Orient, impeccable white dress with long sleeves, white gloves, broad-bimmed hat, and parasol. Uh, this is how she visited shrines, temples, and generally followed a classic tourist itinerary. She returned home without a penny and at 25 uh, turned to being an opera singer in Paris, because that's what you do. Uh, generally, options uh, for women were limited at this point. You could get married, uh, you could be part of a church, or you could care for the elderly. In her mid-30s, her singing career was ending, uh, but she had started a career, uh, as she started to create a following as a lecturer and writer. Unfortunately, the writings of an unmarried woman weren't taken very seriously. So regarding marriage, from an early age, she identified herself as a, as a feminist and wrote this about marriage. This terrain is a battlefield between the sexes, the expressions of familiar language, to make a conquest, to be a happy conqueror, to let oneself be overcome, etc., as if it were a battle in which the male aggressor forces the female to give in against her desire. This is fucking awesome. Um, in 1904, at the age of 36 years old, remember, you're expected to live to 40. Uh, in 1904, at the age of 36, she did end up ma marrying to Philip Neal. Uh, as you can see, he's a well-to-do and handsome man. Uh, together, they lived a bourgeois lifestyle for many years, uh, but with this bourgeois lifestyle, her health was starting to decline. He wrote about her, a bourgeois life would have suited me. You are the antithesis of that. <laughs> Uh, thanks to him, she had money, social position, and attention, but maybe, and make no mistake about everything going forward, she absolutely loved him. The problem wasn't Philip, but marriage, and specifically making space for someone else in her life. Uh, on, in August 1911, at 43 years old, she left for the Orient. Philip thought she'd be gone for a few months. <laughs> Alexandra didn't require an interpreter so she could speak directly to the people. On her journey, she came, uh, she came to cities and was provided comforts of Western culture and was typically invited to stay long term. Inactivity, though, for her always re resulted in depression, and she started longing to reach higher into the mountains, especially as she watched those who were bound for Lhasa. In 1912, she first toured the Tibetan border and was refused permission to cross. In 1912 was also when she was introduced to some of the most formational people of her life, the 13th Dalai Lama and the Gomshen of Lashen, her Dharma master. When she met the 13th Dalai Lama, he asked her how he be she became a Buddhist, that it was inconceivable that one would become a Buddhist by studying oriental philosophy and language in a university. She responded that she adopted the principles of Buddhism and that she was perhaps the only Buddhist in Paris. 
They had hung out for 45 minutes and the most profound advice he had for her was, learn Tibetan. Uh, <laughs> With the Gomchen, uh, Alexandra seemed to be from different worlds, uh, but they both discussed Buddhist philosophy. They shared the same ideas of, and hopes, and they were trying to reform Buddhism from superstition, folklore, and magic. He would praise her wisdom and send translations of her ideas to colleagues in Tibet. It's important to note that in this era, women in the Orient were typically sequestered, enslaved, illiterate, and or mute. With these prominent men and others, she commanded their attention and respect. Furthermore, she was going against the traditions of Western studying. Uh, she was fully committed Buddhist who participated fully in the culture, so participated, not just studied from afar. She takes up an invitation uh, from the Gomchen to live near him near Lashin in a cave in the mountains. During the next several years, she is uh, mentored daily, learning Tibetan and tantric practices, specifically something called Tumo, which is sitting in the snow with a thin cotton sheet and regulating your internal heat to avoid getting cold. This practice is what made her use the flint on her journey to Lhasa and actually start the fire. She is also a, uh, able to leave the restrictive white uniform of the colonials. Uh, you remember that slide from a few slides back? That was her, uh, and instead wears the robes of the people, which she greatly preferred, but other European women would never dare to do. The few months that she was supposed to be traveling has turned into years. Her innermost thoughts were usually left uh, letters to her husband, Philip, who now lives in Tunisia. She's constantly writing to him and wants her to return, but she's pushing forward. His, her requests for financial assistance are always met by him. Early 1916 is also when she first mentions to Philip a boy named Yongden, one of three Tibetan boys who sought her needs. Uh, you'll see here Yongden, this is also Yongden with Alexandra. Uh, Yongden, who Alexandra sees as particularly wise, takes her as his mentor, uh, and this is the start of a lifelong bond which eventually results in Alexandra officially adopting him as their son. Uh, 1916, she also starts planning her trip to Tibet, and this is, uh, it was, it worried, um, but she was worried because the English governor had strictly forbid it. On July 16th, she makes her way uh, to Shigatse, where she is greeted with honors by the Panchen Lama, a person second only to the Dalai Lama. News of this, though, reaches Sir Charles Bell, this gentleman here, who loses his temper, gives her 15 days to leave, and then from there, severely finds the people of Lashin, the town that she was living in, in that cave, okay, and for not telling him about her intentions. This action by Sir Charles Bell will fuel her desire to one day reach Lhasa. When she leaves, the people of Lashin tear down her, uh, her hut that she had built over the years. After this incident, she starts her uh, Oriental Iliad. She travels from Calcutta to Japan to Korea to China. Uh, and with that, uh, she would be called upon to treat the wounded and ailing soldiers and even lect lectured the populace on the dangers of syphilis, uh, perhaps finally being a little bit of that doctor that she had wanted to be as a teenager. Spe she spends most of her life transcribing Tibetan translations of philosophic tracts to French and English. At 50 years old, she can still withstand long hours on horseback or hiking without discomfort. In 1920, she tells Philip not to try and locate her and to not speak of Tibet for fears that the British are reading her letters. His pleas for her to return are met with a response, to return now would have been to tear herself from life itself. On February 5th, 1921, she left Kumbum uh, with a goal of Lhasa. She's been studying and participating in the Buddhist ways directly for almost a decade, and she, as, and as such, is considered to be a Kadoma, which is a feminine spirit that's been reincarnated. This mantle was given to her by the Lamas over the previous years and helps her secure places to stay on her journey. With this, though, she is also expected to provide services and rituals to the people of the towns. This typically means long lines of faithful peasants wanting blessings, advice, and sometimes medical attention. For years, she's met with locals uh, and makes her way around, uh, and she's vying for the right moment to like make her way to Lhasa. The problem is that everywhere she's going, she's making too big of a scene. She was too recognizable, and to, to dismiss her servants and sell her animals would be to rouse too many suspicions. So this is where uh, the journey I started with tonight fits in. October 1923 is where she sheds her identity of Kadoma along with her entourage, everyone except for Yongden. As I expressed, she had a harrowing adventure where they covered approximately 8,000 miles since she began their quest in 1921. These are her published works, which of course don't include all her articles and lectures which she participated in over the years. Near the beginning of this list is in 1927 is My Journey to Lhasa. Unless you study Tibetan Buddhism, it's unlikely you've read her other works, but it's because of these texts that it ensured the ideas of Buddhism became accessible to the Western world. And again, her life didn't stop there. Uh, just prior to World War I, she found herself returning to China and Tibet. Her husband, Philip, passed away in 1941 when she was on this trip. She finally returned to France, continuing writing in 1946 when she was 78 years old. Her adopted son and faithful companion Yongden died in October 1950, 1955. His ashes would be held and, spared to, uh, and be spread with hers in the Ganges River. 
In 1969, at 100 years old, she applied for renewal of her passport. <laughs> near, the, near the end of her life, which she lived to be a month away from 101 years old, she asked what she had accumulated in the way of understanding. She said that she knew nothing at all and was only beginning to learn. She succeeded in maintaining a beginner's mind after 100 years old. Tonight, I have given you a taste of Alexandra David Neal as a feminist, a lifelong explorer, a breaker of social conventions, a trespasser of forbidden territories, and an all-around fucking badass. Her life and her interior exploration was so much more than a singular adventure to Lhasa. One of my favorite quotes of hers is, I never pretended to teach you anything. I only invited you to consider, to doubt, and to seek. I ask you now to raise a glass uh, and wish you well on your own personal journeys to Nirvana with her lifelong motto, walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. Thank you. Yeah.